This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Software Engineering Radio. This is your host, Kanchan Shringi, and our guest today is Matt Frisbee. Matt has worked in web development for over a decade. He's worked at Google, DoorDash, and has been a startup co-founder. As a Google software engineer, Matt worked on both the AdSense and Accelerated Mobile Pages platforms. Matt has very recently authored a book on browser extensions, which is our topic today. In addition to this book, Matt has authored three others, Professional JavaScript for Web Developers, Angular 2 Cookbook, and Angular JS Web Application Development Cookbook. Welcome to the show, Matt. It's great to have you here. Is there anything you would like to add to your bio before we get started with browser extensions? Uh, I think that's good. Yeah, uh, I'm ready to talk about the book. Excited to be on. So let's just start with what are browser extensions and can you give some examples of popular extensions and possibly key industries where extensions are most popular? Sure. So I say in the book that browser extensions are strange and powerful parasites. And I think that really captures the nature of them. So there are these pieces of software that are mostly written with standard web technology, and they sit on top of your browser and they can do a lot of things, just about anything. Really, the only restriction is kind of the permissions you give it. And I describe in the book, they're kind of a hybrid of a website and a mobile app. And so from there, you're really only limited by your imagination because I think most software developers don't truly appreciate how powerful this software is. You know, there are some limitations and we'll get into that in the podcast, but I think that they're really underrated as a platform in general. So major industries. So according to Google, almost half of Chrome users have at least one browser extension installed. And I would bet any amount of money that the most popular extension is an ad blocker because (laughs) that's most people do not want to see ads when they're browsing the web and ad blockers are extremely effective at that. So that's by far the most popular format, but obviously that's not a moneymaker. Those tend to be free and open source software, but there are large companies that are based off of primarily browser extensions. So the largest one that people have heard of is probably Honey, which is an extension that will automatically, well, it does a lot of things, but the thing that it's probably best known for is it automatically looks up and tries coupon codes when you're shopping online and then to get you the best discount. And PayPal bought Honey for $4 billion just a couple years ago. So, you know, Honey outgrew the browser extension platform, but that was still definitely its primary piece of software. So there are large companies. Loom is another great one. I actually know one of the co-founders of Loom. And their extension is a screen recording software that allows you to easily, you know, generate, you know, instructional recordings or whatever of a piece of software and they have raised a ton of money. They're eight-figure valuation. They're a huge company. A big piece of their software platform is a browser extension. So these companies are out there. Other categories are like AI assistance, like Grammarly is a big one, which you know watches you type and is able to you know make corrections and suggestions. Password managers is a big one. So like you know <laughs> LastPass, although their reputation is a little bit stained lately. And then there's also things like developer tools. So you know, React is far and away the most popular JavaScript framework. There are plenty of extensions that are able to kind of plug into a React project and then expose additional information that's helpful to developers inside the browser console. So there's a ton of different places that browser extensions really thrive. And then there are some up and coming areas that I'm really excited about that we'll talk about in the podcast. So you mentioned Honey. You said they started as a browser extension and you know now they have some other mediums. But starting as a browser extension is useful because it's right there where the user needs them. And that certainly sounds very useful for React or any other dev tools as well. So you talked about Chrome. We've used the word browser extension. So can you develop the extension for one browser and expect to be able to run it on all others? Right. So the landscape is a little bit complicated right now. So no, there's not a way to write it once and have it work everywhere. 
there are certain platforms that are trying to get closer to that, but there are idiosyncrasies that are unique to each browser. You know, you have to do it slightly differently. However, the browser extensions have pretty much coalesced around the Web Extensions API, which was the successor to the Mozilla's original extension language was XUL and XPCOM, which was a much more uh, extensible and some would argue a superior platform that was able to customize almost anything about the browser. That has given way to the modern Web Extensions API, which is has a smaller interface, is still quite powerful. And then that's kind of the, the meat of what extensions use to do what they do. So most browsers do support that API, but there are quirks that require special considerations for each browser. So it, there's kind of levels of compatibility that you can strive for. So personally, you know, if, I, if I'm just one person working on an extension, if I publish an extension in the Chrome Web Store, which is by far the largest platform, automatically I can address like 80% of desktop browsers because you get Chrome right off the bat, obviously, which is probably about two thirds of traffic. And then you also get all the browsers that are built off of the Chromium open source browser engine. So that gives you Opera, that gives you Edge, that gives you Brave. There are some others, but just right there, you're addressing 80% of traffic. And so that generally can be a single code base. So that gets you pretty far. Where it gets tricky, Firefox, which they are still transitioning to Manifest V3, which we'll talk about later. And then Safari, which is <laughs> it's, a, its own animal in and of itself. They have a kind of a wacky way of deploying extensions, but it's powerful and pretty new. So really the three large buckets, if you want to get as much traffic as possible, would be like Safari, Firefox, those both require special deployment, and then kind of all Chromium extensions, you can almost have a unified code base. So you mentioned Manifest V3, and we certainly will dig into that, but it might make sense to just define what the manifest file is at this point. So there's some context. Sure. Yeah. So the manifest, that's like the core piece of a browser extension. So when you browser extensions loaded in the browser, the manifest tells the browser kind of where everything is, what it's supposed to be able to do, some basic details like the name and description, icon and things like that. Yeah, it's a pretty simple file, but it's kind of the glue that holds everything together. So Manifest V3 is the latest iteration of the Manifest. Obviously, it comes after Manifest V2. And the transition is kind of controversial. So the Manifest V3 push is being pushed by Google. Pretty much exclusively, it started there. And so the way it was initially announced was that, is, oh, it's going to improve security. Oh, it's going to improve performance. You know, So we're making all these changes. But it's pretty obvious that one of the main intentions is to kind of start pushing people kind of away from ad blockers. So Manifest V3 kind of wrapped into this transitional period is um, a phasing out of the primary API that powers ad blockers, which is the blocking web request API. So the way that all ad blockers work, more or less, is that you can give it, uh, an extension permission to manage every individual network request going on in the browser. So it can see everything, and more importantly, it can manage everything. So an ad blocker, if it's installed, give it permissions with the blocking web request API. So if it sees an outgoing request to you know, double click, which is you know, the Google ad server, it can go, oh no, that's, I'm not going to serve that request. I'm going to block that. And the browser is very well equipped to go, okay, you know, we're, it's network requests fail all the time. Like We just won't load that. And so that's the meat of how all ad blockers work. There's additional pieces of it, but that's the core piece that it's able to, for any individual request, it can go in and zap the request effectively and say, you know, I'm not loading that. Manifest V3 kills that API entirely, or at least cripples it in a meaningful way and replaces it with an entirely new API called the declarative net request. And the problem with that is that for the blocking web request API, you're able to write a piece of JavaScript that runs every time a network request happens or matches a regex or something like that. And then that JavaScript can be arbitrarily complex. So you can say, oh, you know, if I detect an ad request being sneaky, I can still, you know, sniff it out in all these different ways. But declarative net request, that API 
you're limited to this like declarative style. So you're basically passing the browser a JSON file with all these static instructions that say, oh, you know, block request to this domain that look like this, you know, that loads an image that loads JavaScript. It's still pretty customizable, but you're now basically delegating the ad blocking to the browser. Say, all requests that match this criteria, block those. And it sounds similar, but the important difference is that you no longer have the ability to intimately control what requests are being killed in the browser. And so very powerful tool for ad blockers is not quite as powerful anymore. And so now we're kind of hoping that basically the browser vendors that you know maintain the browser code bases, Google, continues to allow the ad blockers to work. And you can see that there's a problem there because they are, <laughs> you know, their 80% of Google's revenues comes from ads. And they're also maintaining this platform that's killing ads. So these things are completely in conflict with each other. And so this transition in Manifest V3, it seems very predictable that this was going to happen eventually. So it remains to be seen what else is going to happen with Manifest V3, but it's problematic because they're kind of watering down what is the mo- probably the most important ability of browser extensions, which is to moderate the traffic in and out of the browser. That sounds really interesting. Though I can imagine, and from what you said, the V2, and I'm, I'm hoping the V3 continues to be powerful in terms of what the extensions can do, but also comes in with security best practices because certainly when there's too much that the extension can do, there's also a fear of, you know, if you don't have the best practices or you don't have the best intentions, that things could go wrong and that could reduce the amount of trust that customers have. So maybe if you can just delve into some security best practices when developing extensions, and then we'll move on to our next topic. Sure. So security is in a really interesting area of extensions because you have to be cognizant of what they have access to as well as what the web page itself has access to. Because I think it's kind of unusual to think when you're writing JavaScript that runs in the page that you have to think in an adversarial way because probably the biggest security hole that you know browser extensions dance around is you know the DOM is shared entity now. So the host web page, whatever it is, let's say you've written an extension for you know a Gmail plugin, for example. So Gmail is rendering its own HTML. Their JavaScript is running, doing its thing. Your extension's JavaScript is also running in a separate container, but they're both talking to the same DOM. So anything that is being pulled out of the DOM, referenced in the DOM, typed into the DOM is visible to both. So like, for example, if you were to build like a widget that is a content script, which is a piece of JavaScript that runs in the page that lets you render whatever you want. If you, for example, have a login that sits in the page and someone types in their username and password, the host page can see that username and password and do whatever they want with it. That doesn't mean, I'm not saying Gmail would do that, but whatever site you're doing, like they have the keys to the castle. So there are ways to protect against that, but kind of understanding where the crossover points happen is really important. And I think the other part of it is that I think I'll go ahead and kind of kick around LastPass recently because I'm a LastPass user and I was (laughs) to change hundreds of passwords last week, which is a lot of fun. The amount of information that a properly permissioned extension has access to is quite profound. So it's not a joke when they say that if they have the proper permissions, they can see all your web activity, everything you type, everything in the page, everything, all things. They can send requests on your behalf. Not saying they do, that all the top extensions are very trustworthy and you know it's a great place for open source to kind of instill trust in the user, but they have access to everything. And so extensions like LastPass that are recording your passwords, presumably to keep them safe, they are accessing a lot of valuable information and they have to be good stewards of that information. And any extensions you build that have access to this important information, it needs to be protected because it really is, you know, how much of our life is spent online. If it can sniff everything you're doing, that's a, that's a really big attack vector. So really being aware of like what you're storing and where you're putting it, that's probably the biggest security concern. And the big last pass breach recently just kind of underscores what can go wrong when you're not a good steward of data. So what's the consumer to do? How do we know to trust an extension? It's a good question. So there's really no 
<laughs> one single way of doing it. So personally, all the extensions that I actively maintain, they're all open source. So you can see everything that's getting packaged into the extension. I find that that, I mean, not a lot of people will take the time to go through the code, but it just being there is kind of, uh, okay, I, I can see what you're doing. And so there's a certain level of trust that that instills. So the way that extensions display permission messages, some people have problems with it because it's a little bit aggressive and it is. So like, for example, the tabs permission, which is a very common permission request. So you can, you know, you know, open new tabs, close tabs, move them around, whatever it is. I think the Chrome permission for that will say, can view your entire browsing history and something else, something very scary sounding. So I think one big thing is pay attention to what the permission warning messages are telling you because that's really the last line of defense. That's like if it's saying it can see all your browsing history and you know read all your web pages, whatever the message is, like that's real. If an untrusted person gets access to this extension, they really can see everything and it cause a lot of problems. And the reason I bring this up is that it's pretty common for extensions to be purchased or people to attempt to purchase them just to get access to the users and permissions. So for example, I launched a chat GPT extension recently and it got a bunch of users right away because I was pretty early out of the gate. And I had people contacting me looking to acquire the extension. I don't know what they were going to do with it. I didn't say yes to any of them, but I don't think their intentions were good because I think it's a pretty common pattern for someone to come and swoop in, buy an extension, do bad things with it and then kind of move on to the next one because they are this kind of asymmetric model that like if you pay a couple thousand bucks to get an extension with you know 20,000 users and you have access to all their web browsing activity that's a problem and that definitely goes on I would hope not too often but those people are out there so yeah pay attention to the warning messages and stick to trustworthy extensions so yeah I mean you know stick to the bigger ones and I, I maybe don't be too adventurous <laughs> so later in the show, I think we should spend a little bit of time given this on how the developer can create more trust as well. Let's move into the architecture now for a little bit. So might be useful to start with just the very basics of how the browser renders the web page and then the key elements of how extensions fit in there. Sure. So the architecture is probably one of the more confusing aspects to people that are new to developing extensions because outside of the manifest file, there's really no aspect that's required for any given extension. And on top of that, there's really no primary user interface with which you can interact with whatever the extension is doing. So there's some big pieces that are common. There's like the pop-up, which is an interface that you can open when you know someone either clicks the toolbar icon or you can also trigger it with a hotkey. There's the options page, which is this like you know a standalone web page that the URL the host is like on Chrome. It's like Chrome extension colon slash slash and then the path to whatever the file is. There's content scripts, which is probably one of the more extensible and customizable aspects where you can inject. JavaScript and CSS into the page and then do all sorts of interesting stuff with it. There's the developer tools interface, which you can add custom pages like right into the browser's developer tools that have access to a special subset of APIs. And then there's the, well, in Manifest V3, it's a service worker. There's a background script that's, it's a service worker, so it's event driven. And then that's like the piece of JavaScript that's like listening to browser events and it can push to storage and, you know, do all sorts of stuff. That's the piece that sort of ties all of the disparate elements together. And so it's a really bizarre stack. So the extension itself functions as like kind of a file server. So if like, let's say you're building it with, uh, you know, you're building like a React app for your options page, you know, all the requests for static files, and things like that are like, they're being directed towards the extension and it's able to like serve these files into, you know, an options page or like. You can so you can serve files directly into the web page itself for a content script. So it's kind of this constellation of different pieces, and different extensions will use whatever is the most appropriate. So like Honey, for example, you know, they'll paint stuff into the page, like a little widget for 
showing when it's trying to inject coupon codes or LastPass when you're using it because all the stuff needs to be protected. It can't put it. It can't put your passwords in the page. So that lives inside the pop up because only the extension has access to the pop up or React developer tools. They will. There's really no user interface outside of the developer tools itself because that's the place that kind of makes the most sense. Because when you're building a website and using React, that's where you're spending a ton of time inside the developer tools. So yeah, it's just a bunch of these pieces that can be assembled in different ways and can you kind of use what you need and don't use what you don't need. So the pop-up is where the user has to take an explicit action to invoke the extension. Is that correct? Right. So the pop-up is probably the interface that most people are familiar with. So there's, right, when you install an extension, you'll get inside like the extension bar on desktop, at least, you'll get a little extra icon that you can, is, you know, is a clickable target. And so most people, you know, are not tech savvy or whatever. This is going to be the most comfortable experience for them because it's a visible button. They can see it. They can click on it. They can right click on it and do different things. But the interface of click the button, get the the pop-up window, that's, most people are very comfortable with doing that. And so most extensions should at least have something there when you click that because people are definitely expecting it. But what I understood is Honey used the content script, which automatically changed the page in some way that the user would recognize, but the user would not have necessarily to take any action to have that. Is that correct? Precisely. So the biggest problem with content scripts, or it's not a problem, it's by design, is that you can't programmatically open them. So if you want to kick open a small window to show a settings page or a login or whatever it is, there's no event that can open the pop-up script other than something that the user directly does. So it's either you're either clicking the icon itself or you're doing a hotkey to open the pop-up, but you can't like, you can't call a piece of JavaScript to open the pop-up. It doesn't work that way. So a lot of popular extensions will emulate that. So sometimes they'll like kind of do a content script widget in a similar spot to where the pop-up would open to kind of make it feel more familiar because that you can open up programmatically, but of course you're not getting the sandbox safety of the pop-up script. But yeah, so like Honey, it needs to talk to the page and it's not handling any sensitive information because of the coupon codes, like who cares? So all the widgets in the page they'll just stick right in there because that, you know, you can control that programmatically and there's no restriction on when you can show it. So content scripts are definitely more user-friendly because there's just more you can do with them. And then you talked about the service worker, which is a background skip. So I assume there needs to be some kind of communication between the background script and content script. Right. So the communication medium for extensions is messaging. So one of a couple different types of messaging, but it's all, it's basically the same concept as a post message that, you know, it, it's this asynchronous messaging and, you know, you can open a channel. It can just be a one-off uh, messaging. It's bi-directional. So you can send a response. Multiple tabs can talk to the service worker at once. You know, extensions can talk to each other. There's also ways for extensions to talk to native software. It's all done via message passing because, the different pieces, they will have different exposure to the APIs. So for example, like a content script doesn't have access, like it can't handle extension events, but it can send messages to the background, which thereby can handle those events. So the background will be able to exchange messages with the content script, exchange messages with the pop-up, exchange messages with the options page and the background, or sorry, excuse me, the developer tools. And so it's kind of acting as the hub for the extension itself. And the service worker is also useful in this case because that's the, it's guaranteed to be a singleton. So there's only ever going to be one service worker for any given extension. And so that's very useful because if you're tying together a bunch of these different UI pieces that, um, you know, have all these different considerations, the service worker, you can always kind of fall back on that. I mean, there's only, only going to be one handing, handling message in this way. And that kind of makes it easier to tie everything together. So we've talked about permissions and in the context of um, a security mechanism as well. What are permissions and what are the different kind of permissions and how does the author request permissions? Permissions are tricky because I devoted a whole chapter to them. At some level, they expect 
pretty much how you'd think that if you want to do something that requires any elevated permission, you request the corresponding permission. So for example, like there's an alarms API. So you can like have a piece of code run in the background, like every minute, for example. So that's called an alarm. And so you request the alarms API. If you want to talk to a certain domain, so like, let's say I wanted to send requests to google.com, I can request a host permission and I would say, okay, give me, you know, define a regex that gives me the ability to talk to google.com from the extension. And there's, I don't know, like a hundred different permissions that you can request. Some of which are, will trigger a warning message and some of which will not. So like, for example, the alarms API, it's not really doing anything sensitive. When you submit to the Chrome web store, you will need to say like, here's what it's for. And you put in like a sentence, but the user is never going to see a pop-up because that's not, there's no opportunity for abuse really. Whereas if you're requesting access to every, you know, the tabs API or you're requesting the all URLs host permission, which gives you the access to everything, they're going to get a pop-up that says, you know, the extension, you know, either on update or when it's installed saying the extension is requesting all this stuff, you know, is that okay? And so a useful pattern, if you don't want to scare the user, because they, (laughs) some of the warning messages can be very scary, are optional permissions. So basically you can have, when they initially install it, you can have the core subset of permissions that your extension requires to work. And those will be applied automatically. And then if you want to have them, you know, on a one-off basis, grant additional permissions, you can do that. You can, you know, it will still incur the warning window for permissions that are more sensitive, but they will, they will be explicitly requesting them. So it won't be as scary as like getting all these warning messages on install. One caveat with permissions, which is a pretty ugly aspect of extension development in my submission is that if you add required permissions to an extension and then push that out in an update, everyone who has it installed will have to reapprove the extension, which is depending on how much they need the extension can have a substantial amount of attrition. So your browser will disable it. Like in Chrome, you know, if you have extensions installed, you've probably seen this before. There's like a little yellow exclamation point in the settings menu. And then you'll have to explicitly re-enable the, the extension that's requested a sensitive permission. And a lot of developers will get bit by this when they're not expecting it because it's a really unpleasant user flow. So if you're trying to avoid things like that, optional permissions are your friend. So permissions is a key mechanism. And you know there may be concerns in how some of these are displayed to the user, but are there other mechanisms in the browser to prevent any extension vulnerabilities? Yeah, so I, Manifest V3 went pretty far to address some of these. So one of the biggest things that was taken away was the ability to execute arbitrary scripts. So that's been taken away and it's unclear. So there are extensions, like they're called user script extensions. And so the idea is that in Manifest V2, you'd be able to install an extension. There's one called Grease Monkey. There's one called Tamper Monkey. They're pretty popular that you can basically define your own JavaScript that has access to the extension APIs that you can do whatever you want, run it whenever you want, about as extensible as it can get. And basically that would be, you know, calling the JavaScript eval function. And then that's what's running your JavaScript or some equivalent of it. But you basically, you can inject arbitrary JavaScript. And in this case, the user wants it. Manifest V3 does away with that entirely presumably to you know deal with cross-site scripting because that's a pretty sensitive thing. So in Manifest V3, all the JavaScript that runs has to come from the packaged extension. So you can't load a third-party script from like a remote website. You can't like type in JavaScript and have it run that. None of that's allowed anymore with the extension of you can run it in a sandbox, but that's less useful. And so all these problems kind of go away to a certain extent when you take away this ability to run third-party JavaScript but at the same time, it's, you know, it's problematic because you're inherently disabling these really useful extensions that a lot of people find useful. Let's spend some time on the extension-specific APIs. So you introduced these earlier on. Can you describe the scope of what can be done with access to these APIs? Sure. So there's common ones, you know, storage is a really common one. So you can request different types of storage that are 
separated from the web page itself. So it's an asynchronous storage. You know, you can request different amounts of space. So there's like an unlimited storage permission and you can store as much stuff as you want, which is useful if, you know, if your extension is like recording video or stuff like that. Yeah. So there's, I mean, APIs for authentication. So one kind of tricky corner of extensions is like, how do you authenticate someone? And so there's this whole set of like OAuth, especially like, how do you deal with like authenticating a person with the OAuth protocol, which is particularly difficult because you need these callback URLs. And so browser extensions have a native way of dealing with these things, but it's kind of, it's kind of tricky to do because these OAuth is kind of built around being used in like a website format. And so, yeah, there's a whole API to deal with like OAuth and extension. Yeah. Like what, I mean, I talked about the messaging. There's a ton of like APIs to deal with like the browser Chrome itself. So there's an Omnibox API, which allows you to like kind of show autocomplete search results, like from the browser bar. There's like a context menu API. So like when you right click, like you can add an entire right click menu that's sensitive to like what you're clicking on on the page. There's a ton of APIs dealing with like network requests themselves. So like you can, you know, you can sniff like what's being loaded on the page. What is the browsing history? Things like that. There's like a pairs of bookmarks API. So you can manage the person's bookmarks, the tabs API I talked about. So you have total control over what tabs are being opened, closed, pinned, muted, whatever it is. Yeah, I, there's a, <laughs> there's the, the list goes on and on, but it's pretty extensive what they can do. And I, it's not really any, that much of an exaggeration to say that pretty much anything that you can do in the browser, an extension can do for you to a certain extent. So can we talk about some of the key differences across browsers that you know of in support of these APIs? Yeah, so browsers have mostly coalesced around the web extensions APIs. So that core set of APIs is pretty well supported. Where there's some fragmentation are on, so for example, Mozilla is planning on continuing its support for the blocking web request API, even though like next week they're about to roll out support for Manifest V3. So that fragmentation is it's interesting. We'll see where it goes because now Firefox is becoming the only major platform that will be supporting the blocking web request API that all ad blockers need. Firefox also has like a whole bunch of extra like themes and things like that. They have their own bag of APIs that are you know unique to that platform. There's some idiosyncrasies with how the different uh, APIs behave on platforms, but there's not a ton. So if you're, I mean, if you're within the core web extensions API, everything, you know, any major browser vendor has pretty nicely come in and supported the web extensions API. So development is pretty nice in that respect. That's good to know since that certainly reduces the amount of work you would have to do to have your extension work across browsers. Moving on to a little bit of detail now on pop-up pages, content scripts, and background scripts. So starting with the content scripts and maybe pop-up pages, how much control does the developer have on the styling? And especially, I think that's relevant in the case of content script because you are updating the existing web page. So what should you keep in mind as you start to style the user interface of the extension and any caveats there? Yeah, so content scripts are an interesting one. So pop-up pages and options pages, those are behave pretty much as you would expect. So you know, it's a web page that you're exclusively rendering. There's no CSS bleed or anything like that. So what you see is what you get for those pages. And so that's really useful because that's, you know, it's more akin to a traditional web development environment where it's it's basically rendering like a website. Content scripts are a different animal, right? So in the manifest, you're defining pieces of, you know, JavaScript files and CSS files that are being injected into the page. And you get to, you know, define when they're injected, and then if there's a domain match, like whether or not a piece of JavaScript or CSS should be injected. But after that, that's, you know, the JavaScript kind of is on its own. And so you have to sort of bootstrap the user interface, you know, just using these pieces of JavaScript. And so there's some interesting considerations. Obviously, one is CSS bleed. So the ideal pattern that I actually can't take credit for this, this is the Plasmo guys who wrote the foreword for the book. They were the first ones that came up with this that I saw. 
was basically if you want to put a widget in the page, but you want to protect it from CSS, you put it inside a shadow DOM. So you'll have the JavaScript will render whatever your widget looks like inside a shadow DOM. And then you can have the CSS be injected inside that shadow DOM so it doesn't affect the parent page. And then it's restricted to only the shadow DOM itself. And so that's a really useful pattern because now you can style stuff the way you want to. And you don't have to worry about messing up the parent page, which is pretty problematic. And that's kind of a big pain point, or that was a big pain point until I started folding shadow DOM into all my extensions. So good job, Plasma guys, on that one. Yeah, but then, as I mentioned before, the content script then, how it folds into the page is really up to you. So there are some contexts where you'll want to integrate more tightly. So if you're, so a lot of like Gmail extensions will, the developers will ahead of time, they kind of know what the DOM looks like inside Gmail. And so they can go, oh, I can look for this certain pattern of, you know, pieces of the DOM and then I can inject my own button in there. And then it will look like a piece of the native DOM. And so then I can style it however I want and I can have it trigger whatever interfaces I want, but it's going to be stuck inside the page. So it'll look like a piece of Gmail. Other ones will like pop over the page. So for example, if you're like a LastPass user, you'll notice that LastPass will stick a little LastPass icon over the end of um, an input element. And if you click that, it'll pop a widget over the page. That's a pretty common pattern because it's, you know, it's pretty cheap and easy to, to locate like a small box widget over the page. And then there's also extensions that will kind of have like a floating button in the bottom right of the page that will trigger something more substantial, kind of like a popover, or like a modal window. That's a pretty common content script pattern. Yeah, so content scripts are, they're really, they have to be judiciously applied because like you can totally mangle the host page or the host page will mangle your content script. So you have to be very careful with yeah how it's being applied in the page. But at the same time, it's the most natural way to like extend and interact with the host page. And it really allows for the most powerful stuff. So you mentioned that the mangling can happen in both directions. And one of the key user experience elements was having a floating element on top, which I assume will be helpful with the CSS property Z index. So are there any best practices around using that property? So it really depends on what the host page looks like. So there are certain pages where it makes sense to just, you know, use the Z index to kind of just force your widget on top of everything. But then you have to be, you know, you have to be sensitive about, you know, is the host page also going to use Z index to push stuff on top? And am I going to interfere with that? Because that's right. So Z index, that's one of the few CSS properties that that's going to cause problems, right? Because you're setting the Z index presumably on the shadow DOM host element itself. So you could be pulling your extension on top of everything. And then the user is going to be like, what's going on? I can't see anything or vice versa. The host page is going to be covering up your stuff and make your extension unusable. So in any event, it really requires, if you're going the content script route, you have to be very sensitive towards what is actually going on on the page because that's really going to drive how you're integrating with the host platform. So like, for example, a server side rendered website will be much easier to integrate with because you know that, you know, if it's just sending you back a blob of HTML, you know, you can modify that without fear of like a single page application, you know, blowing it up. Or I mean, at least it's less likely. Whereas if you're integrating with this, like really involved React app, you know, it could be re-rendering all the time and the URLs might look the same. And you have to be aware of like, is the host page going to wipe out my content script entirely? So all these things are kind of under the same umbrella of really having a good understanding of what your host page is doing and can do that will make it play nicely with whatever your extension is trying to do. Besides the mechanism you mentioned using Shadow DOM, can iframes be used as well to isolate styling? They can. I don't recommend it. It's all the benefits of using an iframe so the problem with iframes is if you're putting it on a host page, you're subject to the same origin restrictions as the host page. So you can't, the host page, you know, if you're trying to load an iframe from, you know, whatever the host website is of the extension, you know, if you're sticking an iframe in the page, the host page, it may zap that outcome request and say, yeah, you can't, I'm not letting you embed that domain. And so at that point, the sandboxing abilities of an iframe, they're harder to work with. And they're a little bit more finicky than a shadow DOM and shadow DOM supported pretty much everywhere. So 
I would say it was pretty rare where the use case of an iframe exceeds the utility and kind of flexibility of just a, you know, a vanilla shadow DOM host. And you certainly don't have a lot of these complexities if you use a pop-up page, but it's not as well integrated with the page that you're accessing. So there's some trade-offs there. Right, right. Yeah. What about the use of JavaScript frameworks or libraries to write these extensions? Yeah. So this is the place where JavaScript frameworks really shine. So as I mentioned before, the pop-up and options pages are working off of the what's essentially a simple file server that the extension is behaving as. And so if you want to have like an options page, for example, so the URL for the options page can be something like, you know, Chrome extension, colon slash slash, you know, your extension ID slash options.html. And that's going to send a get request for that actual file inside the extension file server. Now, if you want to have a really complicated, let's say you're doing a React app there, let's say you want routing. Well, there's no ability to handle traditional server-side routing. So I've found that doing like a hash routing solution is more useful there because obviously, you know, the hash part of the URLs is not affecting the path to the actual file. And so this is where single page applications really shine because you can now have a fully fledged web page that you know has routing and you know can support, you know, going back and forth and things like that, but it's still living off of the same file. And there's really not a alternate way of doing that unless you're having separate, you know, HTML files for each interface. And that's just not as good of an experience as a single page app. And the other part of it is that because it's basically a local file server, it can load everything really quickly. So considerations like, you know, large static assets or, you know, loading things from the server, you know, these things are still important and you don't want to, you know, load 10 megabytes of JavaScript for, you know, like a one page file, but everything's going to load basically instantly because it's loading off your local file system instead of some remote server. So these things make, you know, extensions can be a pretty snappy interface just because, you know, everything's local and, you know, everything's running off of the same box. Thanks for that, Matt. I wanted to cover some other key topics that we've mentioned (laughs) in our talk, but not necessarily in sufficient details. So let's start with the DevTools pages. I think you mentioned that in the context of helping developers implementing React. So can you just give a little bit of what the use case would be? What is an example of an extension here in this area? Sure. Well, the two that I use frequently are just React developer tools. And then there's a a Redux, React Redux extension as well. And so the premise is relatively simple. Basically, an extension is able to create custom panels inside the browser's developer tools. And it's pretty similar to an options page or a pop-up page that you can render it however you like. But it also gets access to a few special browser APIs. So it can really tightly understand what the DOM structure is like. You can inject pieces, you know, scripts into the page to locate elements or, you know, simple little script injections. You can sniff web traffic in a really a rich way. And so typically the way these are used is that like the React developer tools extension can tell if the web page is running a React app and then there are different, you know, there's different ways to kind of make them play with each other. So you can have it be like, oh yeah, like the, you know, your React app is rendering this way and, you know, these components are working this way and, you know, props and so forth are filtering down so it's especially useful for kind of debugging and understanding what's going on with single page applications because they can intimately integrate with what's going on on the page, understand it, and then show it in developer tools in, in ways that, you know, you can, you know, interact and understand kind of what's going on behind the scenes. And so I would most all major single page applications have some sort of developer tools like companion extension like this, since it does prove to be so useful in so many cases. Okay, makes sense. So we did chat about manifest V2 versus V3 to some extent. You know, you said the key difference was it might make it harder. It likely will make it harder to implement ad blockers. What else is different and what else is the challenge of migrating from V2 to V3? Yeah, so this is a big pain point for certain extensions. So most extensions will find that the the transition is pretty painless. 
but there are a few types of extension that are their future looks pretty bleak. So you're right. So off the top of my head, so we've talked about user script extensions, so Tamper Monkey and Grease Monkey. So the ability to run custom JavaScript is getting thrown out the window. The Chrome team has said that they're looking into ways to continue to allow these because these extensions have millions of installs. So it remains to be seen what's happening with those, but those are, last I checked, there was no path forward for those, although the Chrome team has indicated they want to save them. Other ones are, so the service worker has some interesting, introduces some interesting problems. So previously in Manifest V2, the background was a headless web page kind of. And so you would have access to the DOM and DOM APIs. And so certain extension would use those for authentication, audio APIs, things like that. And so now that it's a service worker, there's no DOM anymore, right? It's just the service worker global object. And so there's things like JS DOM that lets you kind of emulate a DOM, or there's like the off-screen canvas API, which lets you recapture some of this behavior. But taking with a DOM has been a big headache for a lot of extensions. So some of the workarounds are keeping a designated, like a tab open all the time, like just have a supplementary HTML tab open all the time and then use that DOM. That's not a solution though, because that's, I right, the user has now this extra tab floating around all the time just so you can have access to the DOM. It's a bad solution. So it's not clear what's going to happen with those extensions. They also might be in trouble. And then one big one is the life cycle of the service worker itself. So there are some extensions that, like let's say you wanted to open a WebSocket, a long-lived WebSocket, or something that needs to run for an extended period of time. Chrome will aggressively shut down a service worker as because it's a service worker and it's designed to be, you know, this quickly destroyable, restartable thing. And so any extension that needs a background script to run persistently no longer has the ability to do so because the Chrome will shut it down after I think five minutes is the typical timeout. So there are hacks that can prolong the life cycle of the service worker, but any extensions that need a long running background script, there's no path forward for those either. And all these problems I've mentioned, the Chrome team has indicated they, they want to address them and has said that for a long time, but it seems to be progressing slowly. And at the same time, it seems like, so I'll put it this way. It seems like the Chrome team cares because they had initially set a rollout date of this month, actually, January 2023, was that was the hard stop date for, I think it was, all Manifest V2 extensions in the Chrome Web Store would go dark. And you know, it would, they've already cut off V2 submissions, but the existing published V2 extensions could still be updated and would still be public. They have pushed that back to, I think, in the middle of 2023, so June or something, because they know that they're not ready. And all these extensions that are extremely popular are going to be killed if they turn them off. So it seems to me the Chrome team cares about you know preserving these extensions that are kind of getting crushed by Manifest V3. But I don't really know what's going to happen because it doesn't seem like there's much of a plan. And I don't know. They haven't rammed it through yet, but like it would not surprise me if it got to that point. They just said, well, you'll have to figure it out. So yeah, <laughs> in summation, Manifest V3 is pretty controversial and it remains to be seen what's going to happen. But if you're writing a new extension, you should start with V3. At this point, yes. Unless you're really, you know, people are still writing you V2 extensions because, you know, they're targeting Firefox or, you know, they really want to hang on to the old APIs. But, you know, if you want to use the Chrome Web Store, if you want to have the most users, V2 is dead. Time to go for V3. So I did read about a Safari web extension converter. Do you have any experience using that? Yeah. So this was, I made sure to cover this in the book. So this is a, a really interesting development. So I think it was, uh, let's say two years ago, Safari or Apple rolled out extension support for Safari. And so traditionally extensions have not been a mobile platform. So Google obviously has never rolled out extension support for mobile Chrome. I think everyone kind of understands why they didn't do that because they don't want to lose the ad revenue because it would be, you know, billions of dollars out the window if they did that. So I think they just said, yeah, we're not doing extensions for mobile, you know, too bad. So there are ways to get extensions on mobile. Firefox is one way, but you know, there's a Kiwi browser for Android. So you can do it on an Android phone, but there's really no like first class support from like the primary browser vendors until Safari rolled out extension support. 
So it's pretty far away from how you would typically develop extensions. So extensions have been, you know, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. It's basically just bundled together and then shoved into the browser and the browser understands what to do with it. In Safari, it's packaged kind of like an app. It does function as essentially an extension in the browser. So if I wanted to publish an extension for Safari, I'd build it inside Xcode. I'd have to get an Apple developer account and I would publish it on the App Store. And then once it's installed, like on your phone, for example, you'll see it installed as kind of an app. And when you dive into the code, it's pretty interesting because all the same extension pieces are there. So you still have a manifest, you still have content scripts and you know all, all the files still work the same, but there's this kind of wrapper for the app. And so the wrapper itself is a mobile app for Safari and you can talk to it with the native messaging API. So there's this entirely extra piece of software that's running on the phone that's, it's a Safari app. Um, I'm not a Safari developer, but it, it's, I mean, it's, you, you can see it on the device and you can like write code for it to behave as an app. So it's this whole extra piece that lets you kind of talk to the phone itself. So the Safari aspect of it is interesting for that reason, one, because it's kind of this new domain, but it's also the first major foray into extensions for phones because, you know, the iPhone is by far the most popular phone and Safari is, you know, has, is a huge chunk of users being able to run an extension admittedly inside a walled garden is still pretty exciting. And it's really the hats off to Apple for doing that because it seems like Chrome, the Google team was just never going to do it for mobile and mobile computing is more than half of web traffic these days. And it's kind of silly that, you know, there's <laughs> that we're not able to use it in mobile devices. So good job, Apple, for supporting that. And so it's still kind of a clunky interface. So developing forward is kind of it's kind of difficult and it's not nearly as easy as publishing to the Chrome Web Store, but it is certainly a promising future in the context of browser extensions. So not as easy as a Chrome Web Store. So what is the approval process? Do you have a separate one for each browser? Yeah, so each browser has its own store. So, you know, the Chrome Web Store, that's for Chrome. Although, caveat on that is that you other Chromium browsers can install from the Chrome Web Store. But Edge has its own Edge extension store. Opera has its own store. Mozilla has its own store. Yeah, so you have to, if you want to appear in these stores, you have to submit you know, your bundled extension to each of these, and there's a separate approval process. So I'll say that it's a pain for sure. The Plasma guys who wrote the forward, they have a pipeline that allows you to automatically deploy to all the stores, which is really awesome. And I suggest anyone who has to deploy to all the stores, it's quite something. And they've put a lot of work into making it great. But it's, you know, you can also do it just like one off. So if, you know, if you just want to publish in the Chrome Web Store, you know, there's an API you can do it through, or you can just upload a zip file. That's, you know, the zip file is pretty low overhead. And then, yeah, there's... uh I should say it depends on what your extension has asked for. So if it's a low permission extension that doesn't ask for anything sensitive, I will typically see my extension like go live in under 30 minutes. So it seems like that's an automated approval pipeline and they Google has some automated process that they go, okay, yeah, that's probably not stealing anything. So you know we can just publish that, go right ahead. So like the book has a companion extension called example Chrome extension. That, well, because it has to demo all of the APIs, you know, the extension requests basically every API imaginable. So whenever I submit updates to that extension, it takes days because obviously someone has to like sit down and look at it and be like, okay, why are they asking for all the permissions in the world? And then, you know, then it gets published in the same way, but that takes much, much, much longer. So I think the approval process is pretty straightforward. I think it's just uh, developers need to understand, like, if you're requesting certain extensions, it takes like 50 times longer for the approval to go through, which can be pretty annoying. Let's spend a little bit of time, maybe a couple of minutes on testing and monitoring. Is there anything unique to testing extensions, you know, or is it similar to how you would test any other web application? Yeah, so testing is tricky. So a lot of it's pretty manual. So one interesting thing with Manifest V3 is that for modern web developers, pretty much every build tool offers a hot module reload feature, right? So it can quickly swap out pieces of the application that were updated. There's no reload required and it can show it to you immediately, which is amazing when, you, when you're writing code and don't have to refresh the page every time. 
The problem is that this bumps up against what Manifest V3 allows for. So, and depending on what piece, so like if you're writing a content script, for example, and you're writing a, let's say you've written a, a React widget to be injected into the page, the hot module reload can't reload just that thing. So it's not compatible there. So you have to do a page reload. And at the same time, you also have to be careful about when you need an extension reload. So like when you're going to kick out the service worker and replace it with the updated one. And so there's a whole bunch of pain points when you're doing this. So for example, if you're one thing that I still bites me in the butt to this day is that if you're inspecting the service worker when in development, if you leave the inspector window open, it will keep the service worker alive even after you reload it. And so all these really weird bugs like come out of the window. You're like, what is going on? And so it's just the browser. It's like, okay, I got to keep this alive because you still have the inspector window open. And so, yeah, so testing extensions is kind of hard because it's living in this weird like browser space and then all the traditional, you know, build tools are kind of geared towards web development. So some things translate, but yeah, it's still a manual process and there are still all these kinks that may or may not be worked out. As for monitoring extensions, I would actually say it's a superior experience to monitoring web apps. And the reason for that is for the same reason that extensions are so popular because ad blockers for a web page and ad blocker eats like half of your analytics traffic. So for example, you know, if you stick Google Analytics on a page, the number of people using your web app, I usually, you know, <laughs> you pad it by like 30 or 40% because those requests are getting killed by ad blockers. You will never know that those people are viewing your web page. However, if you are installing analytics inside an extension, other ad blockers can't block network requests from your extension. So if you're sending analytics from the service worker, you're going to get perfect fidelity for your analytics, which is great. Like being able to see 100% of the user activity and not have to worry about ad blockers eating all your stuff, that's great. So monitoring, I would say, is actually nicer than web pages because you're not losing all that analytics data to ad blockers eating your lunch. Mm -hmm. Time to wrap up now. So you did talk about the Plasmo platform. I think this was built by Stephen Alexic and Lewis we will go, I hope I'm pronouncing the names correctly, who wrote the forward to your book. And you talked about a use case where the platform does help by for the approval process across browsers. How else do these platforms help? Yeah, the Plasma guys, they've gone a really interesting direction. So they've kind of built this declarative model. So when you're building an extension, instead of kind of explicitly labeling everything out inside a manifest file, a lot of the boilerplate stuff gets generated for you. So they've figured out like a good way of injecting, you know, one or multiple content scripts. They've figured out a good way of managing permissions and messaging and things like that. And so they've built it into this kind of opinionated platform, but you get all these benefits once you use the platform. So they have a really, really nice command line interface. As I mentioned, they've got the store deployment pipeline. That's great. Yeah, they're actively working on it. <laughs> they're, they're great guys. There's a lot of fun to talk to them. And so I think they're really onto something. So there aren't a ton of platforms and a lot of people home rule stuff, but for anyone who's looking to like find a platform to easily get started, like look no further. Plasmo, like those guys are those guys are killing it right now. And they have, you know, they're they're working on some really important stuff and they're really advancing sophisticated extension development tools and Boy, Lord knows we we need those because this space is uh, it's still kind of the wild west. It certainly is. I couldn't find a lot of material besides the official documentations, uh, and then I chance to and the book. book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we'll definitely have a link to the book in our show notes. Okay. How else can people contact you? Yeah. So Twitter's a good way. My Twitter handle is Matt Frizz. Yeah. So buildingbrowserextensions.com is the website for the book. You'll be able to buy the book there. There's contact info for me. Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. There's a number of ways to reach me uh, or just Google my name. My personal site is mattfrizz.com. You can find my contact information there. So yeah, pretty reachable. So certainly a very interesting conversation, Matt. We've covered a lot of topics. Is there anything else you think we should talk about today with respect to browser extensions? So there is one thing, and that is kind of where the future is for browser extensions. 
So I'm sure you're familiar with ChatGPT, which was released in December and has taken the world by storm. And I think that there's a really interesting pairing between AI tools, especially LLMs like ChatGPT and things like extensions. So I wrote a blog post about this, but there has been an explosion of browser extensions that use tools like ChatGPT um, and other yeah, open AI APIs to do cool things inside the browser. And so a lot of the ones that have come up will like can write emails for you and can like summarize articles. And you know, there's hundreds of extensions now that utilize, you know, these language models in some interesting way. And the pairing is really opens up some interesting possibilities because like if you think about what a web page actually is, right? It's this hypertext, you know, it's a pretty consistent length, you know, at most a few thousand words usually images and things like that. And the inputs to these large language models can handle that amount of text. And so there's this new space where these AI tools can like really richly understand like what you're looking at and can, you know, unpack all these things. So they can summarize what you're looking at, or they can, you know, have this conversational understanding of like what your browsing is. And so there are certainly privacy implications of like, you know, do I want to be feeding, you know, this closed source AI model, what I'm looking at, but browser extensions can, what I really see them as, is like, it's almost like a, it's a glimpse into like the future of augmented reality because it's, you know, they're adding these contextually useful interfaces where you need them. So because it can so richly understand what the page is showing, it's able to go, oh, you could really use, you know, a little widget here that does, you know, X, Y, Z, or, oh, you know, we should really you know, we should format the page in this interesting way because this will help, you know, with X, Y, Z. So because an extension can richly modify and understand the page and because LLMs are able to quickly ingest the contents of the page and do useful things with them, there is this really interesting future where browser extensions are kind of this assistant that are, you know, kind of modulating the way that we use the web. And, you know, obviously so much of what we do is now, you know, inside a web browser or some computing device in some form. And so having this layer over what we're looking at, that is a smart layer and is able to, you know, modify and suggest things really opens up some interesting possibilities. So I'm really excited about the future of this pairing between browser extensions and things like chat GPT. Maybe it won't be the form of necessarily like a browser extension because, you know, they're mostly limited to desktop browsers and that's you know, that's really only half a web browsing, but the ability to, you know, have this controlled layer that's like this assistant and can understand what you're looking at and what you're doing, it gives a small glimpse into the future of computing. And it really excites me in a profound way. I did notice your article on LinkedIn. We'll definitely have these links in the show notes. This is a very interesting conversation, Matt. Thanks for coming on to the show. And I'm happy we could have this conversation. It's an unusual space and I was happy to be on to talk about it. Thanks all for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.